last day. Hello. Uh, now, this is an unusual time for me to be streaming, um, so I'm not expecting to have too many people watching live. Uh, and that's entirely my fault, not the fault of my guest, uh, that I had a clash and my guest was gracious enough to uh, move the interview from the original scheduled evening slot to this afternoon because I did not wish to lose him in entirely. Uh, my guest today has got quite an extraordinary history. He is both a filmmaker and a cult film a uh, biographer of several of my favourite films, including Flash Gordon, Conan the Barbarian, both the Dalek movies, the book of which I have behind me here. Um, so without uh, no further ado, I'm going to bring in John Walsh. Here he is. Wow, look at that setup. It's even more hey impressive guys. than mine. Great, <laughs> great to see you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the, the channel. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know you're going to have... Oh, we've got three people watching already, so some people do tune in in the afternoon. Um, uh, I know that you're going to have some great insights um, into some of the films that you've talked about and also the industry in general. But one of the things I didn't mention uh, in my intro for you is that you are also, like myself, a massive fan of Ray Harryhausen. And I get the impression that that might be where it all started for you. Um, can I ask you a couple of very quick questions first and give me the shortest answers that you can and then we'll get into it. What was the very first movie you saw at the cinema? Ooh, it may have been The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Wow. Okay. And what was the last film you saw at the cinema? Oh, wow. That's putting me on the spot. Um, it's... Um, Barbie. <laughs> no, no. Gosh, nothing is... As re I was going to say something quite recent. I think it was Avatar, the new Avatar. The um, Avatar to the way, the way of yeah. water. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Um, and um, would you... Could you give me two, uh, let's say three films that would be in your sci-fi fantasy film top 10 of all time doesn't need to be in any particular order just to give our audience a sense of your tastes although that may be apparent um, from behind you june brazil and uh and uh, possibly time bandits did you say june june yeah do you mean the recent june or... the david lynch. i always oh, mean I, the david loved lynch the, one. Yeah. I love the yeah. david lynch june that's interesting yeah. um mm. fantastic yeah I, I i i nearly had a Harkonnen soldier toy. I don't know if you remember that there was a sh little range of toys I've, that came I've out. I've got a bunch of those. I've got the Harkonnen, I've got Paul Atreides, I've got um, Fade, and I have the Baron, yeah. of course, as well. That's I have right, one yeah, the that's... Game, like the I have the Worm. That's well. right. They built, I remember seeing the Worm. Yeah, no, they, they, were, they were gone in a flash. They came out very briefly. They didn't particularly sell. Uh, no. And then they were gone. Um, a bit like the Starship Trooper toys that you uh, were actually really good, um, really robust, and I can't get my hands on them, and I'd love to get a load of arachnids. Uh, to well, look, make there's it. a whole story about Clash of the Titans, Mattel, and their little figures from Clash of the Titans. I spoke to Ray Harryhausen about it. It was all a big to-do. Everyone's tried to buy them for lots of money online. We're making these fabulous new figures now, but remind me to tell you the story of Mattel and uh, and the Clash of the Titans figures because it's uh, quite the story. Well, Let's um um let let's get into all that and uh, let me not forget to put up your uh, amazing uh, little bio here that we're going to run across the bottom of the screen. There we go. I'm wearing so a Dalek if... for you, Lance. Today, look, I'm wearing a movie Dalek. Let's wow, say. it's a it's an unofficial. So Studio Canal won't be happy. An unofficial movie Dalek T-shirt. That, but um... that's a that's a nice T-shirt though. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I uh, well, I want to start with let let let's sort of go back to the beginning for you. I think it's fair to say that you're, judging from the first film you saw at the cinema, that your your interest in the sci-fi fantasy genre probably began with the work of Ray Harryhausen. And you'd be the third guest I've had on this channel that has met him personally or had some kind of friendship or relationship with him. But you're also, if I'm right, you're, you're currently on the, the board of his trust. Is that right? Yeah, the Ray set up a charitable foundation in the mid 80s and uh, he asked me to become a trustee um, not long before he died, a couple of years before he died. And right. There's only three trustees, myself, his daughter, Vanessa, and, and a legal um, person as well. And we have one member of staff. And so we're, we're quite small, but yeah. um, in terms of an archive with 50,000 items, we're the largest animation archive outside of the Walt Disney Company. So quite fast. Wow. Because I think you've got... I mean, within that collection, not necessarily at your house, that you've got quite a few of the original pieces of his collection and 
um, yes. and things like the map paintings and all, all of that sort of stuff from the various movies. Yes, so for the main creatures from the main films, we have most of those. And certainly from everything from sort of the mid-60s onwards, we have everything. And they're in different states of repair and restoration at the moment. Um, but for example, Golden Void of Sinbad, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger and Clash of the Titans, the last three Harryhausen films, we have it mm. all. And there right. are signs, different size um, Krakens and so on and Pegasus. We have everything. So uh, Ray looked after everything, kept everything. He was a hoarder like us, Lance. Well, uh... <laughs> Indeed. And I don't like to think of myself as a hoarder. I just like to think of my man with a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> Channel, but, five, um, Channel 5 would call us hoarders. Don't worry about that. You know, uh, well, hoard. yeah, I mean, I, but I use all the stuff that I've got. It's not like piles of newspapers uh, <laughs> sitting in the floor, sitting on the no, floor that I don't not. ever read. Yeah. Um, the stuff that I've got, I actually get it out. And, and most of the stuff, <clears throat> most of the Thunderbird stuff, I've even got a Thunderbirds game. Uh, and most of this stuff was was built for that game or bought purchased for that game uh, to run at games uh, conventions. So uh, all of my stuff, I tried to practically use it somewhere, and and a lot of it was in the shed for quite a while. So until I until I started this YouTube channel, all of these uh, pieces, including the the Diecast Zero X, which is sitting in there, um, they had been kind of under lock and key for about ten years. And I thought, well, what good is it? No one's seeing them, so. So I, I thought they'd make a nice decorative backdrop uh, for the YouTube office, um, as it were. But but back to you. So uh, it all started then with the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. I mean, what was it about that movie and being introduced to that world that, that I guess was your gateway drug into, into fantasy, as it were? Well, my, my parents always would take me to half-term films, so whether it was animated Disney films, but I preferred the Ray Harryhausen films because um, you just do, because it was in full colour, it was on the big screen, and it was actually very scary. Of the three Sinbad films, Golden Voyage is the one that has black magic in it. It has Tom Baker just before he became Doctor Who. He, he's playing the evil wizard, isn't he? He's playing Prince Cora, yeah, so he's yeah. kind of very, very evil in it. And... Uh, it's all about black magic. It's about calling on black arts to create things, make yourself youthful. There's a fountain of youth. So mums and dads like that. Uh, dads yeah. like to see Caroline Monroe wearing not very much at all. Thank you very much. I, I, um, I mean, I wasn't a dad, and even I was quite confused as a child about Marilyn Monroe when she came onto screen. And I remember her in The Spy Love Me. And yeah, I, yeah. She's great. She's a great friend of the, of the foundation. I sat down with her and Ray Harryhausen in 2011 to record a commentary uh, for... Um, Golden Voyage of Sinbad because Ray hadn't recorded commentaries unbelievably, Lance, for most of his films. So I kind really? of under the air. One of the first things I did is I started pushing that right around 2010. We started. We started with Clash, his last film, and worked backwards. Right. And then we kind of stayed in touch with people who were friends of the foundation, like Caroline. She did Golden Voyage with us, and John Landis, who wasn't involved with Ray's work, but is a great fan of the foundation. Uh, we've become good friends over the years. He sat in for the mighty Joe Young because that's a, a favourite of his. He loves ape feature films. And if anyone right. knows anything about John Landis, they'll know that he's a great fan of apes. He has apes in his films. They're in different spots and different parts of his films from trading places. right? Where yeah, I was just thinking in trading places, there's a guy in an ape suit and then you've got the real one in the cage. And well, it's Yeah, well, there are actually one. two guys in two ape suits. One is like a party ape suit yeah. and he's on like a, 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 a kind of a a buck's nice or something and then the other guy is in quite a sophisticated animatronic -y kind of suit yeah like playing a, playing a real ape that, that... Playing, playing the real ape it's very good it's very effective yeah, so yeah you know, he came and sat in with us on different commentaries we have wow. those now in the foundation um we kind of protect the legacy we are a charity so we're we're always sort of for non-profit but we do engage with the big film companies when they want DVD extras material, we've been involved with reissues. We've advised on the 4K restorations of some of the films. We've, we've had some books published. Um, Harry Housen, the movie Posters by Richard Hollis. Uh, Vanessa Harry Housen's published her own book on her father, mm. sort of 100 items. And I did this one, um, Harry Housen, The Lost Movies. Because, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I wanted to start with that as we're starting with Harry Housen. Now, that, that's a book that um, it is still available on Amazon. Yes, so it's um, second edition now, second print run. And I think it's it's fair of me, and I don't think John would would complain if I if I described his books as kind of very colourful, easy to pick up, 
um, coffee table books that will impress your friends at any given party. Um, yeah. And Harry House and the Lost Movies, as you can see, is available on Amazon. As you can see, it's got 263 ratings and is rating five stars out of five. Now, that's not easy to get um, on Amazon. It retails for the hardcover for around £25. Uh, there's not many left in stock and you can get some used ones slightly cheaper. Um, so um, now the lost movies. So this would be movies that would be unproduced. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So there's a combination in here. We have <clears throat> films that Ray wanted to make but couldn't and didn't. Right. There were films that Ray was offered he, that he turned down for various reasons. And then there are scenes that were cut from the films that we love for both technical and financial reasons. So we put them all into this one book. And right. uh, it, it was quite um, a great thing to reveal to the world because there's some great arts and sculptures and test footage all in this great book. But, 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 you know, this is the slight rub. I, I had to really think hard about it because Ray Harryhausen himself didn't like to talk much about the unmade films. He didn't like to talk much about the cut scenes. And when I'd sit with him and ask, you know, why is this? He'd say, well... You know, I won't do his American accent, but he always sounded like Charlton Heston to me. He had a very deep oh. um, West Coast accent. And um, in fact, the first time I, I contacted him, I rang him up because he was the only R. Harryhausen in the phone book. And I rang the number after six, as you do when you're using your parents' phone. And I yeah, said, oh, I remember that. Do you remember that? After, after six, yeah. John, if it's uh, a phone call, if it's, um, is it local? And I said, well, it's L West London. No, it's South London. So it's localish. And uh, after six, so on the dot of six, I rang him up. And I said, can I speak to Ray Harryhausen? Hello, this is Ray Harryhausen. I got a right fright because it was him himself on the phone. So that's anyway, how you met him? That's you how I met him. As, I was you called him as a kid on your parents' landline. That's mad. Well, I was, I was 18. I was at the London Film School at the time. I was looking for a subject for my documentary. Because right. um, for the third term, you have to do a documentary, a 16 millimeter documentary. And right. uh I ended up making a documentary. I'm just going to show this to your to your viewers there, Lance. It's yeah, a, let me put you on. Let me put you on with, solo view so we can get you a bit bigger there. We there. there we go. Yeah, that's me with the. Oh, that is you. Right? Yeah, I've seen that picture on. Uh, I think I saw yeah. that on your Facebook. I look. I look like I'm auditioning for Depeche Mode. I was always wearing black to try and that, look older. That, yeah, you 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 could have been auditioning for Depeche Mode there quite quite easily. <laughs> so um, I was 18. I was very young. How was he on that first phone call? He, he was very nice. I mean, he was, um, I, I explained to him who I was and what I wanted to do. And I think I sent him a letter then, a typed letter explaining a bit more about the London Film School and and uh, what I had in mind. And then he later kind of wrote back and said, please come to the house and tell me more. And oh so I visited him at his house, um, in Ilchester Place. If anyone knows that part of Holland Park, it's a very big house. It was previously owned by the filmmaker Michael Powell. So he used to live at that address at number two, Ilchester. And uh, uh, just around the corner now um, is um, uh, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin and Robbie Williams. So I think he's living in Michael Winner's house um, just around the corner. I used to know Michael right. quite well. Um, so he was, I used to be vice chair of the Directors Guild of Great Britain. And Michael used to effectively underwrite the costs of the Directors Guild um, for running it there in the late 80s and early 90s. So went round to Ray's house and it was full of all the creatures in his office he had all of the various creatures from all of the movies and he kind of asked me questions that he was right to ask about what do you know about me and i knew loads about it i knew about stop motion miniature rear projection the different ways he used backwinding in cameras all those photochemical um kind of tricks because mm. this was the late 80s and there wasn't um computer Pre technology available to me as a film yeah. student so i'd be shooting on film about this filmmaker. And I said to him, I'd like to recreate some of the Dynamation setups. So Dynamation is that combination of live action with a model uh, to get him to explain how it actually worked. And of course, being a film student, the budget we had to make the film was a zero. Yeah. zero. So um, what ended up happening a few months later, it got shown as part of the end of term screenings, 16 millimeter film by me, which when I look back on it now, I think it's pretty good. Um, there's clips of it available on my YouTube channel and it's particularly good because it's narrated by Tom Baker ah, so I rang up his agent absolutely and I had a quite a strong South London accent at the time which I, I lost at film school I did. I never looked for it after I lost it I'm sure it's on the floor somewhere Where, where in and, South uh, London did you grow up? 
in in um, in Charlton, and I now live in Greenwich. Okay, yeah, so I, I I grew up in Kingston. Um, oh, okay. And, you know, now live in sort of like Crouch End Turnpike Lane. So it's quite funny how Very we nice. both gravitated to different sides. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so but, I rang up his agent and said, "Would would would Tom Baker be prepared to do a, a narration for free?" Which is a great thing to ask of a man who gets big mm. fees for doing uh, voice narration. But of course. Uh, for those folks who know Doctor Who and know Ray Harryhausen, Barry Letts, the producer then of Doctor Who, was looking for a replacement for John Pertwee, had asked some usual suspects again, like Ron Moody, who said no again, and some other people who either weren't available or didn't want to do it, which is hard to believe. He hmm. went one wet Wednesday afternoon to see the Golden Voyage of Sinbad in Leicester Square, just to kind of get away from things a bit. Saw Tom playing Prince Kura, came out of the cinema, rang his agents, at London management and said, oh, I'd like to see Mr. Baker, please. It's Barry Letts here from the BBC. Tom Baker found out that evening when he came home from working on a building site as a labourer. And his landlady had a note there saying, oh, your agent has rang. The, I'm recreating the uh, the accent there. I don't think it was Irene Handel, but it could have been. Yeah, so, Your agent been. has rang. Yeah. And uh, you, you wanted to buy the BBC. So... When he saw Barry Letts that week, effectively, he didn't audition for the part. They sat and chatted about his film work. And he was offered the part of Doctor Who because of the Golden Voyage of Simba. And Tom has confirmed this himself. And that's why he did the free narration for me on my, my little short film. And okay. I'm, I'm, I'm most grateful that he did. Because it catapulted me into professional work when I left. I was directing at BBC when I was just 20. So um, phenomenally young back in those days when I hadn't been through the BBC director's course and everything else. So... What, what um, stuff but, did uh, you direct at the BBC? Well, in, in stuff through my own company. So, um, what, what, I was what, sort of, what sort of shows or material genres? Um, um, well, um, you can find all my stuff online. There's a Wikipedia page for me, an IMDb page, um, documentaries mostly about um, vulnerable people, vulnerable issues around homelessness, around disability, hate crime. Um, I did some arts documentaries as well. Um, I formed my own company quite quickly because the BBC and other channels were looking to do things independently. So um, yeah. I started doing that. And that was great because working for someone is, is great, which is what I wanted to do. But actually creating your own programs, pitching them, co-owning them and getting them relicensed over the years. <clears throat> that's something else entirely. And it's an yeah. entirely different revenue stream. And so I was in the fortunate position of never having been employed but always been busy through my own company. And it's not even freelance work. What it is, is you are commissioned as a company and then it's up to you to deliver in stages, programs, and you get paid in stages by broadcasters. And I've right. been doing that now for years, for years and years, Lance. I'm wearing a filter here. I'm actually an 80-year-old man. Okay. So the, uh, well, you're, I mean, I, mean you, I must find out what moisturizer you're, you're using because you're looking pretty good for it. Um, so, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I work in independent film which i wouldn't recommend and um yeah i've i've proper aged in the last um five years and and that's all because of the stress of film production no doubt about it um and it, well, it was i found it stressful but i don't know maybe it hasn't i don't know if i have found it that's true look the thing i like about it is that you don't have to work with the people you don't want to work with whereas in television when it's you're on staff and you're told on let's say randomly say whether it's a panorama or a Doctor Who from back in the day, directors and in-house people would be moved around onto different shows, Zed cars, are you being served? Sure. If you didn't like people, that's hard cheese. You just had to do the job you were assigned to. It was much more like being sent to Vietnam as a soldier, but in TV. Um, whereas <laughs> independently, you can, you can choose the pieces on the board. And for years I've done that. And it's obviously a skill set now I lack working with people I don't get on with is a skill set I don't have, whereas people in modern offices are you more used to that, getting things done. But, um, two, I did two feature films in, in that time as well. But um, it's kind of, you know, you, is life a journey or is life a competition? And I think once you figure out it's a journey, not a competition, yeah. then you're more relaxed about what you do. And, that's, um, that, that, you know, that's, some, that's something I've um, learned very recently to just embrace and... and, and um has done me no end of good actually uh i want to focus uh, for a little bit on doctor who and the daleks um now 
These are the two Dalek films that were made with Peter Cushing in the 1960s. I think they were made within a, a year and a half of each other, give or take a few months. Yes. Um, Dalek Invasion of Earth, I have on a Blu-ray next door. In fact, I should have grabbed it, uh, but I also have your, your wonderful book uh, right here, my own, my own copy, which as soon as I was oh. aware of its existence, uh, which was not actually how, how this came about and how this interview came about, I'll tell you quickly, was I went to the Science Museum with my friend and her rather moody son, and we made the mistake of going in the toy shop section uh, it took him ages to get out of it because uh, he wanted a, a Lego and I offered to buy him an E.T., which he uh, gave back to me. And it's uh, it's up there. Um, oh, I love E.T. Yeah, I, he, the kid ha obviously hasn't seen the film yet, so he'll probably want it at a later date. But I saw your book in there and I thought, oh, what's this? And um, I know that there was a big relaunching of the vinyl soundtrack and all the rest of it. And there was a lot of with, with stills and stuff, but I hadn't seen the book before. And so I had a look at the, the, the book and um, I thought, oh, well, you know, it's, a, it's quite a hefty price tag. Let me see if it's on Amazon when I get home. And uh, which is, yeah, I do like to support shops, but, you know, times are hard. So you've got to save money where you can. And buying books is a bit of a luxury for me at the minute. And uh, as soon as I got home, I saw it was on Amazon and I, I ordered it. Um, and I must have gained the attack on the Dalek spaceship with the Robo men and all of that stuff with figures went in my childhood, no end of times back in the day. And I don't know if you remember, and I can't, I think it was Parker Brothers that made it. There was a Dalek board game with these miniature Dalek figures that came in it and you, you turned the thing round in the middle and it made the Daleks move and you had to get your guy yes. to the centre to try and destroy the sort of central control unit. It was actually quite a clever little simple game and I bought it specifically so I could have the gold and silver Dalek figures that came with it because in the late 70s, which is when I got that game, there wasn't an abundance of Dalek miniatures available at that time. They'd all kind of been and gone, and the resurgence of Doctor Who merchandise had yet to occur. Now, of course, there's all kinds of companies that do them. But um, So this threw um, back a lot of memories for me, but I'm just amazed at the level of detail on the production, the different set pictures, and we can actually we can see some of the... Uh, stuff here. There's some preview pa pages here which I can show people. You've covered everything from the merchandise that came out at the time um, to who was cast and why. Uh, incredible um, access and stuff about each of the cast members. And of course, things like, um, you know, the process of getting that iconic shot with the Dalek coming out of the Thames, which I now realize was pretty much the only shot that they did outside of Shepperton to depict uh, London with some clever cutting and things. And um, <clears throat> that was really interesting for me to see that because you always feel like more of the film was shot in the Docklands and things than, than you know, was that. And there was, there was a big backlot that they used of an existing set that they already used. I didn't know that before. So um, fantastic stuff. When did you first see these, these movies? Was it on TV yeah, for, for me, um, Lance, it would have been on television. And I was well aware of the, um, the TV series, of course, you know, the Doctor Who we'd watch every week. And yeah. I think um, it would have been around probably Tom Baker's era when, when Tom Baker was going out on air that I would have first seen these. And I was like, great movies. You know, this is going to be even better than Tom Baker as Doctor Who. And, of course, you, the, the minute you see the first one, you're like, oh, what's with the music? And hang on, where's the TARDIS? Uh, and it's like, oh, hang on, this isn't quite as you'd imagine. So it's, um, mm. it's very different because he's not a time lord. Uh, Milton Sabotsky, who created um, the Doctor Who movies, did something quite um, quite sort of innovative and clever in that he optioned the films, but then changed them around a lot. So I'd seen them mostly on television um, when they got reissued then on VHS in widescreen and then on DVD, then on Blu-ray, then on 4K. I was involved then with the 4K um, uh, release. There was a mini version of a preview mini version of this inside the 4K release um, oh. because by that stage I'd, I'd, I'd already done two other books um, on Studio Canal properties, uh, Flash Gordon, as you said, and also Escape from New York, John Carpenter's dystopian yeah. 1981. I'm going to come on to um, those next. But... That's fine, yeah. So, so it was mostly television. I mean, I have seen it in cinema since, but it's only since it's been kind of remastered and rediscovered. But interestingly, on television... 
The reason it was shown as a kind of a fill-in, if the weather was bad and Grandstand couldn't be shown, they'd show these Dalek films, was because the license on them was very, very cheap. So the BBC and ITV would buy films in bulk from studios and they'd have a license on them to, for so many plays over so many years. And some of them would be exclusive deals, like ITV had the James Bond films, as we remember growing up. Always mm. ITV had bulk premieres. The BBC had deals with different studios, but they had deals with British Line and their library. And these films were very, very cheap to show. So they were great fillers for broadcasters. And that's when it was shown. I think there was something went wrong with Grandstand and they showed this instead. So it was really unexpected. It was unscheduled, I think, um, when I first saw it. And so great fun. Um, I've always liked them. As I've become older, I've appreciated them even more. And as I started doing these books, I was saying to my publisher, oh, can I do the Doctor Who and the Dalek um, films as a book? And they were kind of a bit sceptical because they thought there wouldn't be a big enough market for it. And uh, because I was, um, this was my fourth book for them, they were like, I think, that I will let John Walsh have his head, let, let, it, let him do this. And, uh, and to be fair, Titan Books takes all the risk on these because, as you say, the large format coffee table books, they cost yeah. an absolute fortune to make. They're available in every store in the world so Barnes and Noble in New York and other places that are not New York also have them look at that how fabulous they're really expensive the pages yeah. are really thick and the cover is yeah. embossed to do an embossed cover is like super duper expensive um yeah. and there you're feeling the luxury of that it's like a uh, a box of cherries all gold from the 80s where it had oh. like an embossed leather cover um yeah so, I remember them. <laughs> so you know a very special book but the funny thing is Lance the book was announced in, um, I think it was March 2020. What year are we now in? 2023. So it was, yeah. a, it was announced in March 22. And then when it was released on its sale day in November 22, it sold out on day one. So it completely sold out on pre-sales. I can, I can so believe that. Never underestimate the uh, enthusiasm of Whovians. Because uh, people Darling. were buying two. As you do, yeah. you do buy two. Why would you not buy two? And uh, Titan was saying to me, it's selling like hotcakes. And I said, we're going to print some more. So they printed a second run to hit the Christmas market last year. And that sold out as well. So the book's on its um, third unofficial print, I think, now. Um, yeah, yeah, there's no contents have changed. They're all the same contents. I don't know if it, if it says anywhere um, in the front about the edition or anything like that. I don't think so. No, oh, I think yeah. it's still, it's, there's still, a, I don't think they want to change any of the print versions on it. No. Well, that's first fine with me. Me too, yeah. Uh, well, everyone can have a first edition. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, they all feel like a first edition that way, I suppose, which is, which yeah. is nice. Um, the funny thing is, is I do remember Grandstand being cancelled and the person coming on. And so instead, this afternoon, we're showing Doctor of the Daleks. And because I found football, as boring as anything, um, I was overjoyed. I do remember one of those occasions. I also remember an occasion when a Bond film came on that was unscheduled, and I think that was also oh, wow. a cancellation of sport, I, I, I think. Um, it, it, it's interesting. But the first time I saw Doctor Who and the Daleks was um, Invasion of Earth was not on the telly. Um, I don't know if you remember, but some cinemas on a Saturday morning in the, in the late seventies going into the early eighties used to do special showings at around kind of, it was about 11 o'clock for kids. And I got to see about three films that way um, for the first time on the big screen. One of them was Thunderbirds are go. One of them was Thunderbirds six. And the other one was Dalek invasion of earth. The uh, doctor who and the Daleks, the first film, I definitely only saw that, I think, on, on TV. And I believe that was also part of a Saturday show. And I missed it. And I was very annoyed with my parents, who I guess were probably responsible for me missing it in, in some way. So the first time I got to see Invasion of Earth was actually on the big screen. And it really blew me away. I was particularly impressed with the model of the Dalek ship and the interior of the Dalek base and, you know, and the use of the Robomen. These were all things we hadn't seen on the TV um, before because I guess they, they just didn't have the budget. And I think the model of the ship, when it's flying through the air, still looks really great today. You know, it, it does. It was up. a large model. I mean, it was, it, yeah, yeah they, they photographed it well. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great film. I mean, it's the fact that now you're paying £50 per film to get them on 4K is, is, um, is testament to the film itself. You know, other films that came out in the 60s, uh, mid-60s, haven't been scanned in 4K, aren't in a glorious box set that you have to pay £50 for. And this mm. is done not because they're keeping fans happy, but because there is a market for it, you know, mm. not just with fans, but fans and beyond. Of course, it future protects content for television as we're moving towards a kind of a 4K and 8K resolution reality in our in our lounges. I, I think that the, the general um, opinion, and correct me if if you think otherwise, is that the Invasion of Earth is the superior of the the, the two films. Um, certainly, I like it better than than the da- Doctor and the Daleks, but it did less well financially. Um, the first one just made that That's bit right. money and they were going to do a third one and the third one was cancelled because the second movie wasn't as big a hit as the first. What, why do you think that was? Because it wasn't that long that, that they were released apart. That was part of the reason, you know, because they were released quite quickly. Milton Sabotsky thought that uh, it would be good to capitalise on Dalek Mania, so he was right there. But actually, if we look now... And we're seeing lots of superhero films and lots of Star Wars retreads that aren't doing quite as well. It's because no sooner Mm. have you finished drinking down eight episodes of that, there's another 10 episodes of this um, with a baby Yoda or a Mandalorian or whatever it might be. And they're all great shows. But I mean, when we think about Star Wars, when 77, 80 and 83 were the gaps between um, the the films coming out, we were desperately thirsty for those films. I think had he waited maybe one year, but he wanted to kind of keep the ball rolling. But the, the problem was the first film was sold on the fact that here are the Daleks on screen in colour for the first time. Great. What about the second film? Oh, it's them in colour on screen for the second time. So it doesn't <laughs> have quite the same impact. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even though it's best a film, and it's kind of some great violence and action set pieces, and it goes at a real pace. How do you market it as uh, the Daleks again? Again. Um, yeah. So, you know, the fickle finger of of, uh, of the public. It did do well, though. It made money. Um, I think he should have ploughed on with, with the third film. There's details about it in the book of what he intended. And, uh, of course, Milton was a very savvy man. He was the first man who commissioned a new and up-and-coming horror writer, um, Stephen King. And so he had options to remake many of Stephen King's films or adapt them for cinema. He was the first person to get that. And you can see his name contractually on credits for things like Cat's Eye uh, later on because um, he still had a, a kind of a, 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 a foot in the game, as it were. Um, and he did the, the brilliant Martian Chronicles with Rock Hudson that was on television in the uh, early 80s. I'm a big fan of that. I, I, Ray, I, uh, Ray I watched Ray. that at the time. I seem to recall it was, was it an ITV? Sorry. No, BBC co-production. And, was it, was uh, it BBC? But it was on a, it was on at that a, a weird time. It wasn't quite nine o'clock. I think they started it at like either eight or eight thirty. Mm, um, on a Friday night. Honestly. Yeah, just in time when if you really begged your parents, they might let you stay up and watch it. And um, and of course, I was very excited about it because it had um, spaceships and you know all the rest of it. But then, of course, it was very much a cerebral man's science fiction film and i think um the first time i watched it i i fell asleep on the sofa and then when i woke up you know we were in one of those flashbacks where the martians were making the people think they were somewhere else and i was as a kid i was completely confused i i was totally lost i watched it all again recently and kind of i can i like i like the final scene with the, with the martian and the deserted city and um that's it's quite fabulous amazing. it's haunting it's spooky mm. if you watch it, watch it late at night. It's been restored now. You can guess it on Blu-ray, and it looks fabulous. And I think it's very underrated. And I know Ray Bradbury himself didn't like it. He didn't like that adaptation and went on a world tour telling people why not to watch it. Uh, <laughs> really? Shock and yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. So the much shock and horror of people involved with the, with the production. Funny enough, Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen were great, great friends and grew up together and... Uh, stayed in touch over the years. So the foundation has lots of correspondence with Mr. Bradbury. So strange well, connections. One of the, one of the things I wanted to comment on before we move on from the Daleks, um, the Dalek movies is um, of course, they were both directed by my, my friend's dad, um, Jason Fleming, um, Gordon Fleming. And 
uh, unfortunately, I wasn't friends with Jason. In fact, I met Jason a few years after his father passed away, which I think was in the mid to, to late 90s. And I, I met Jason in, I think it was either 99 or 2000. I, I forget now. But I'd seen, I'd seen a lot of pictures of, of Gordon. Um, and I'd never sort of had cause to say, oh, yeah, you know, um, that, that particular photo. Um, I'm just dro dropping this link to Jason in, in case he wants to pop in and say hi. And you never know, he might be sitting on his sofa at home. Um, I never had cause to say, oh, yeah, he really looks like you. Because um, all the pictures I'd seen of him, there were traces of Jason, but I didn't see that. But then I saw this picture in your book of him and his dad sitting here. And oh, yes. that, that could be Jace. And, and, ja and I've also, yeah. you know, I've directed, been lucky enough to direct Jason about four times. And I remember one occasion where he was sitting on a rock with exactly that posture, exactly that hair, with a pair of Ray-Bans on instead of the, the, the thick glasses and smoking a fag. Um, uh, which he didn't normally do, but he said, I'm on holiday because uh, we were filming in Greece. And um, and it looked, it looked exactly like his his um, father there. I was trying to work out what he's sitting on. Um, I can't quite work it out, whether it's some kind of exercise thing or... or I think it is a piece of exercise equipment that's just been sort of left around the studio. That, that yeah. other picture, though, in your right hand there, Lance, that was provided to me by... The man standing next to uh, Gordon Fleming, which is Anthony Way, who was the first AD on the uh, Doctor Who films. He later became a senior executive on the, the James Bond films in the 80s with uh, with uh, Roger Moore. I, I read about it. That's mentioned in the book, isn't it? Because I remember yes. reading about, about yes, that. Yeah, he was also on Clash of the Titans. He was the first AD on that as well. So we, we, we interrogated him for the Foundation's oral history archive to make sure we found that everything about his yeah. work as the AD on that. So well, and, and so you should while these, um, while these people are, are still around. So changing gears um, a little bit, you, um, you, you've done a making of... Uh... I'll just show you these. Uh... Oh, yes, please. Can I just show you these? Uh, this is a book plate that the publishers published that printed for me. And originally we're giving these to the first hundred people who sent us an Amazon review and it's a sticker. So I sign it and you stick it in your book and it comes with an exclusive bookmark as well. So if, uh, if you give me your address, uh, Lance, I'll pop these over to you later. But oh. um, if any of anyone at home wants one of these, you can find me on, on, on Twitter and everywhere else. Just Google John Walsh filmmaker because they sent me another batch, another batch. So my work is not complete I do my own secretarial work here, so I can send you a free signed book plate if you send me a screenshot of your Amazon review. Please make it nice and kind, the review. And you can get uh, these. They're exclusive. They're only available through me. And uh, and it's nice to have with the book. I think it's extremely unlikely that anyone's going to give you um, a bad review of um, the making of the Dalek movies um, book. I mean, it only might be uh, because somebody just, you know, I know there are people who don't like Peter Cushing's portrayal. I mean, um, everybody's got their favourite Doctor Who, and it tends to be um, the Doctor Who that was around when you were growing up, I, I find. Uh, and so, of course, the Doctor Who that was on telly when I first started watching Doctor Who was John Pertwee, uh, who had a very fatherly, grandfather feel about him. And my dad and him, they looked and sounded and acted very similar. So there was the running joke in the house was dad's on telly again when John Pertwee um, came on. And he did have that very um, fatherly uh, vibe about him. And thanks, Josh, my moderators, just put your website uh, there. So that is also in the chat for everybody. You can find John that thanks, way Josh. as well. Um when I saw Peter Cushing's portrayal, I thought his portrayal was quite similar to Pertwee. He had that kind of fatherly, nurturing thing, um, similar to the relationship he had with the assistant of Sarah uh, he had with the young girl. So for me, the reason I probably liked Cushing when I saw him was because he wasn't so far removed from the doctor that I grew up with. Um, so for me, he worked, but I could completely understand somebody growing up with Hartnell who comes across as a ratty school teacher. Um, is, is his portrayal of Doctor Who is, is miles away from Peter Cushing's. 
Um, but yeah, okay. So um, leave some reviews for John, and he will send you an exclusive Dalek uh, bookmark and uh, sticker. Um, I wanted to ask you about Escape from New York, if I may, because that that's yes, absolutely. you've you've got a making of a uh, book about that, which is out. Um, I don't own it, but um, uh, one of my regular co-hosts uh, does have a copy. Oh, there it is. Look at that, New York, nineteen ninety seven. This is the exclusive French language version. So um, Escape from New York's in three languages now, in Japanese, in uh, German. And the French version actually has was the French release of the film as its um, cover, which is New York 1997. Um, it wasn't called right. Escape from New York when it was released in France. So it's called New York 97. Um, and so we've, we've managed to change the cover art so it's, so it's like that. But the rest of it inside, it's still, it's still my book. But in French... Um, which is nice because I did French O level at school. I don't think I passed it, but um, there you go. I don't do the translation, by the way. They get someone. No, no. Who, um... I, I'm I'm guessing <laughs> it's very. I'm guessing it's the format of it is very similar to your, your Dalek book with a breakdown of the cast, the um, you know, the is, behind yeah, the breakdown scene, of the cast, shooting, special um, effects, unpublished images. I just yeah. try and find you something. My favorite shot. Where is it? Um, I'm a I mean, big fan of visual effects. So, yeah, practical, especially the practical model work and stuff like that. Um, I, I'm a, a huge fan, and I I didn't realize until recently that they actually built a massive model of New York to do that long shot of it in the distance. Um, That's right. There's the guys. Oh, I spoke to some of these guys who are working there on an opening shot. There we go. Yeah, so that's the opening shot where we see New York for the first time, and there's a yeah. little helicopter that flies past, and a, and a kind of a map painting that happens as well. All these yeah. kind of fabulous pictures are in there. Uh, this guy here, uh, Robert Kaiser, I spoke to him at length, and he gave me things that had never been published before. Um, and, and I wow. think that's the key with these books. People have seen the films and read extras and heard directors' commentaries. It's like, well, why am I buying a book about it? Because we found that new information. We've got new material to look at and i think that's partly why the books sell as well as they do i put my documentary head on and i think right yeah forget about my view of the film that always happens in the intro yeah what are the untold stories whether it's with doctor who is it true piece of cushion wasn't around on the second film that he became ill we have the answers i had access to the paperwork all of these books like with conan are the official story of the film and people say to me what's that is it a marketing gimmick no it means the rights holder who owns the film and all of the paperwork has given me full access untethered access to the finances the contracts disciplinary letters the completion guarantee bond film finances <clears throat> let me have a look through everything to do with the wicker man which is my book that comes out in october and uh that was incredible because the story, the story of the Wicker Man is what happens in the film, but the making of it would make your hair curl. And, uh, you know, that is quite phenomenal. So to have access to all of that stuff and the misbehavior of, of everyone on the picture through paperwork and documents, because people thought, was it true this happened and that's happened? We can straighten the story out. And of course, right. the rights holders will look at these books whether it's Escape from New York, and say, can we say this, can we not? And I always make sure that what I say is verifiable. So as a documentary filmmaker, sure. you need to have verifiable sources, not just my opinion, um, which is not present. Um, so I try and make sure that my view is, is, is tempered with the facts. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I have the vinyl soundtrack to Escape from New York, just down here i'll see if i can grab it in in a second um because i'm a big soundtrack movie guy and in the oh, 80s i was a whole buying yeah and I was... about it so did, where yeah. did you buy your soundtracks from did you go to the store i used to go to 58 dean street records do you remember that place i used to go there i do remember that store. run by the two there. run by the twin brothers in soho that's right and yeah. Well, once I found it, that was where I always went. Oh, uh, yeah, there he is. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, did you, um, once the book came out or, or even during the, the undertaking of the book, did you have direct contact with John Carpenter? Because he can be quite elusive, I've heard. I, I did. I was in touch with John Carpenter because um, 
there's a whole issue around him, his films and the rights and so on. And so it's tricky. So I had to go through sort of third parties. And uh, so I went through, um, gosh, now I'm, I'm having to think. Uh, he was the guy who played The Shape as well. Uh, Mick Castle. Mick Castle. Mick, Ca Nick um, Castle, Nick yeah. Mick Castle helped a, me with some one of the producers. Um, yeah, and, he, and uh, he, he kind of wrote the screenplay with John. He was... He was the shape in um, in Halloween, and he's also yeah. the director of The Last Starfighter, which is on my list of books I like to um, films I like to make big, expensive books about. Um, that, so, that's um, that's a, that that was great. A, and uh, that's an absolute favourite of mine, Last Starfighter. Uh, and again, I've also got the soundtrack to that, um, and I've spoken and to it's, and it's tracked down most, of the, a, most of the cast yeah. actually. Um, so, and it's, it's such an underrated film. Oh. Yeah, yeah, very, and the score is yeah. um, the score's amazing. And I've spoken to the composer, um, and he was somebody I was looking at getting for for a, for a film, and I I made the mistake of using someone else. Um, <laughs> I really wish I'd used him now. <laughs> um, but um, w when you're negotiating those rights and everything, which must be quite complicated, is that when you come across those kind of stumbling blocks, is that something that you then turn to Titan Books and say, okay, guys, can you get the lawyers to negotiate this thing? Or, or is that something that you undertake yourself? I mean, um, it can't, can't be your job, surely. Um, well, it, it was on my second book. Uh, so the Harryhausen book, I kind of agreed and signed off on everything because I'm a trustee of the foundation. So that was straightforward in terms of mm. license. For Flash Gordon, um, Studio Canal had the UK and European rights on the film. I thought, oh, great. That's great. And we had a relationship with Studio Canal from Tyson Books. And they said, well, hold your horses. We don't entirely own, outside of releasing the film on video, we can't license other products like toys or T-shirts or books. You'd have to get the uh, rights holders who've always said no in the past. And I was like, oh, how very disappointing. That's why there hasn't been a Making a Flash Gordon book. So mm. in America, Universal Pictures had rights on Flash Gordon. And then the underlying rights of the character Flash Gordon, the original Alex Raymond comic strip, are with Hearst, the giant media company, and King Features and Hearst. So right. um, we need to speak to them as well. And it was like, this is why the book hasn't been made before. And I think other people tried to get all three parties together. So I said, look, if I can get all three together, can I write this book? And they said, yes. If you get all three parties, you you can, and so I did, and the book happened, and I think that was the point at which Titan then went into bat for me on other books to make sure I got them, and get me uh, sort of rights. Um, it, it's difficult because studios, some studios like Warner Brothers, have a policy not to issue licenses for books mm. on on films unless they're current films or films in the current cinema circuits. So there's a bunch of Warner Brothers films I wanted to write books on. Um, like making a clash of the titans which they own by default because they have the mgm library as part of their library mm. um and you know warners themselves are very sympathetic we get on well with the folks down there so you know thumbs up to all the guys down at the warner archive you know we're fans of your work um but you know when companies have a blanket policy it's difficult and you can't go and make a book about the making of let's say batman from 1989 the michael keaton film that'd be a fabulous mm. book with all the love design work with Anton first, Tim Burson, who I know would probably write the forward and so on. Great book, would sell really well. You can't just go and do that because Warners will have to come and shut that book down because if they don't, other people will do the same thing. And if you don't put those fires out, then what are your IPs worth? And at the yeah. Harryhausen Foundation, Ray Harryhausen's name is a trademark. And so we have to go in with our big boots on and say to people, no, you can't release this under the name of Ray Harryhausen, because we own the trademark. And if we don't challenge it and it gets released and it's an abuse of our trademark, our trademark can be revoked. So we have to constantly renew the rights on the trademark. It's expensive for us and we're a charity. And mm. so people come along and think, well, I'm fans. Can't I just do this? You can't. And it's at your own risk if you publish. And people think, oh, isn't it fair use? No, nope. it's not. Because once you start to add a a pound or dollar amount on the back of a product you're selling at someone else's IP. It's no longer fair use. Fair use is your yeah. teacher at school lecture about all of these films, why they represent masculinity in cinema in the 20th century. That's fair usage. 
But once you start charging £19.99 to come in and hear the lecture, that's not. And so right. it's a good rule of thumb for people. But, um, you know, there's a big list of books I want to write that they either can't get me the rights for or they can, but the rights are expensive or right. they can get the rights and they're expensive, but they'll pay for it. But they don't think there's a market for the book. Because right. These books have to sell by the crate low because they're super duper expensive. Yeah. So I can't really do a niche book on a, just a few thousand prints. Um, no. So that's kind of shut me out of some books I like to write. Saturn 3, for example, I'm a big fan of. And the, the Kirk Douglas yeah, film, Farrah that, Fawcett. That's an interesting movie, um, actually. It's a great it's movie with a great style. I love yeah. it. With Harvey Keitel, voiced by another actor. To, um, so I don't want to jump in. I don't want to jump around yeah. too much, but I don't want to forget to <clears throat> show my audience some of the exclusive Ray Harryhausen toys that have been released, I think, by a company in Japan. So I'm just going to yes. put that banner up now. Um, I probably should have mentioned this earlier when we, we touched on him at the beginning. But um, John personally kind of oversees these, I believe, um, when, when they come in and you sort of say yes or no. And they've done quite a few that, that I personally would like to have, but can't can't because John's told me they've sold out already. Um, but let's have a look at some of them. Show us the ones you can uh, show us, and I'll, I'll put you on the, the big uh, well, screen here. Behind me here, the Bubo the Owl, which is a one-to-one -one ratio replica. You see the Redosaurus from um, uh, the Beast 20,000 Fathoms in both color version and monochrome. But these are the latest ones. The Centaur from the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. It's one piece, so right. it's not articulate. So it means it doesn't have those awkward little joins and pieces in them. But his hair was modelled on David Bowie in the early 70s, who had a ginger crop top um, hair. The hair pops off, and underneath you can actually manipulate the eyepiece on a little stalk here to do your own, little, um, a bit like Action Man's Eagle Eyes, if you remember that from the, uh, from the 80s. There's a magnet on I top. I do indeed. Pops on. I do kind of extensive unboxing videos for these on my channel, and I share them with the Harry Harryhausen channel too. So you can find out a bit about the history of the creature, the original model, and I kind of unbox. And I do an on-screen comparison as well. Oh. So that's that one. Um, I've got two snaky ones to show you next, which is this is a, a smaller character, but she's she makes a big impact. Uh, Naga the Snake Woman, who's a servant woman, in the seventh voyage of Sinbad, and she turns into a wonderful snake creature by Torin Thatcher, who's the uh, evil magician there who um, shrinks Sinbad's bride. And he does this to her handmaid and turns her into a half snake, half woman. She smiles briefly in the film, but she's immortalized forever here in this beautiful, beautiful figure. It comes with a round carpet as well, so you can prop her up on that. And one of the ones we've been most asked about, and She's finally here, I think. Although I get these as advanced previews, so I'm not sure if they're out in the shops yet. You'll have to Google them. Is Medusa from Clash of the Titans. And for those of you who know me and my tours and lectures, I can tell you, if you don't know, the face of Medusa was based on a famous Hollywood actress. And Ray never revealed until after that lady passed who it actually was. She was a famous beauty, by the way. And this is why Ray was slightly conflicted when he told people that it was modelled on the face and eyebrows of Joan Crawford. I can see that, so, actually. So there you go with that. So uh, that figure appears oh, to go We've done for, some larger pieces as well. It goes for £300, that one, the Medusa. £300. I've, I've seen and there's a deluxe version of it, which comes with something else. So all of these have kind of a deluxe element. So you're probably looking at just the figure on its own. If I can show your viewers, it yeah. also comes with this base, the Medusa base, right. the deluxe version, which is one of the soldiers that's been felled by Medusa. Uh, Look at him. Wow. Wearing a bit of a cravat um, or a bit of a scarf. Now he comes with, if I can just position that correctly, with this fire brazier as well. Right. So you can wow. pose Medusa alongside... Wow, look at that. So you can create your own template yeah. sequence. Isn't that fabulous? Um, so wow. you, the, these are really expensive, the extra pieces. You don't have to buy them. That's why we ask for them that you can buy them separately. Um, and they're made of um, poly resin, so they're quite heavy. They're very detailed, and they have little 
um, rubber holders on the end. The figures themselves are mostly made out of super vinyl, so they're, they're not brittle, and they have great detail on them. I'll pop that back. And we've done a rare thing here. We've done a one-to-one -one recreation of, if people can guess what this is, it's Miniton's Heart from Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. And it actually has a mechanical mechanism inside, so you can actually make it move through using a, a, a magnet against the batteries here. I didn't put my batteries in today, but take it from me, it works. And it goes around and round and round. Um, wow. And it's fabulous. You can buy that separately to the 50 centimeter Miniton, which I have up here. And I think that with the 50 centimeter Miniton is about 800 pounds, but I don't think there's any left. Oops. So, um, yeah, that quite well. I was quite keen to get my hands on a Talos model, which I think you in, informed me is no longer available. You've got one up in the corner there. Yeah, yeah. there's a couple of Talos's. There's that giant one up there. So there's one so where it's reaching for the boats as well. Um, right. The other side of my office. If I can, I'll try and turn this around without disconnecting myself from the live stream. Oh my God, look at all of them. Um, wow. Uh, so, oh, there he is up there. So um, he, he's up there crouched down in the corner next to uh, – you can see him crouching down with the boat. He's lifting up the yep. men, uh, the Argo boat. What's the creature in the middle next to the Triceratops that's holding a staff? Looks like some sort of lizard man. I'm trying oh, to – Oh, that's the Emir from 20 Million Miles to Earth. He looks a lot ah. like – Yeah, uh, okay. The, the Kraken from uh, – I'm going to stick a, a hot light on this so you guys can see it a bit better. Oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you got the Pegasus up there as well. Pegasus, the Kraken, one of my faves. They're all my faves. Um, Carly, Cyclops. And we're doing different versions, so different poses are coming. So we have a, a minute on there in the corner. You can see a great big minute on up there. Wow. Uh, so I'm, I'm running out of shelf space. But, um, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> So, but these are fabulous. And, you know, the, the crazy thing is, Lance, I spoke to Ray about the original Clash of the Titans action figures from Mattel. And I was showing him on eBay how much they're selling for. They were over £100. And this was back in around 2010, um, 2011. And he, he wanted to know, well, why did people want to pay so much for, um, for the figures? And it's because you can't get them, particularly on carded backs. And I said to him at the time, when I tried to get them, I could only find them in WH Smith's. So this is the story, the crazy story. If people know anything about um, the Cola Wars, so if you were a news agent and uh, you were selling Coca-Cola, then Coca-Cola would give you a fridge to put your um, cola into so it keeps it cool for customers. But on the proviso that you don't put PepsiCo, Pepsi-Cola products in there, so, that was, you know, people widely know that. And in a sense, it kind of has a logic to it because you're not you're not paying to um, you're not giving a free fridge to cool down other people's stuff. And that happens with confectionery as well, with Cadbury's and Roundtree and whatnot. So anyway, if you went into Kitty City, which was one of the big toy shops in the 80s, they had all of the Star Wars figures um, from all of the Star Wars films down one side of the shop. Everything Star Wars related. And they would give you standees in your shop for free, which might be like Darth Vader holding the laces figures and so on. So they give you all of this promotional stuff on the understanding that you didn't stock other boys' toys that were figures, action figures, from movie or television. And so when Mattel turns up with, um, you know, whether it's uh, Battlestar Galactica or the, or the Black Hole, which was, was at LGN, um, mm. and Clash of the Titans, which were Mattel, um, the toy shops are like, oh, we'd love to have these, but, uh, you know, the big Darth Vader standee says no. And so they, <laughs> had to, so they had to be sold in newsagents. But here's the rub. You might think, well, what's the big deal? We're in the newsagents. The newsagents had to charge more for them. So when they were in WH Smith's, what would have been a 99p figure <clears throat> of Bib Fortuna over at the Kitty Sissy? <clears throat> it's going to be a 299 figure of Calabos from Clash of the Titans at WH Smith's. Because right. they had to charge more for shelf space alongside the cartridges and the reams of paper and so on. And so kids were in there thinking, oh, oh, I could, oh, I could get maybe two or three figures across the road, get another couple of storm yeah. shoes for the price yeah. of this. I um, do remember news agents um, selling uh, certain ranges of figures like Mac Men. 
Uh, and that's yes. probably why. That's probably why. That's, it. that's exactly why. I thought and you might like out. to see these pictures. Um, if you remember, I told you that there was a Jason and the Argonauts game at a games convention not that long ago. And this is in wow. 2013. So it just yeah. goes to show how um, the topic still resonates with people. Um, and I, I, I can't remember who painted these um, figures for the game, but there's a, there's a Talos um uh, equivalent um uh, but the first time that i saw this game was at the same games convention but it was in um i think it was in 1992 and the way that they'd made a talos for the game was that they converted an action man figure into talos <laughs> and painted him gold and i wow. have been trying to find a picture of that um online for you but it's eluded me sadly um, because I have seen a picture of it before. I just I didn't download it, uh, which was a, a shame. But um, there's a picture of an action man, Talos, standing on the two rocks with the boat going under it nice. somewhere on the internet. Um, and that was the original. Uh, so it just goes to show that it's still... Uh, mind you, I guess a lot of men of our sort of age run games at games conventions, so it's not entirely surprising. Uh, that it plus that you can it, afford yeah. it now. If you had to ask your mum and dad, can I have 99p again to buy another figure? You just bought a figure, but I want another one or this one or that. Now you can spend 800 pounds and maybe not eat for a week, but have yeah. have Minotaur and, and the Minotaur hearts. Maybe just have cup of soup for a couple of weeks. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's the sort it's of choices the... I would have made if I were a child. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I, 800 pounds for a, a figure for me is is uh, in the current climate is a little bit too rich for my blood, sadly. But I know that there are collectors out there that have got extensive collections that will put their hands in their pockets quite gladly. Uh, as will I uh, when I win the lottery. I'll be I'll be straight on the phone to you for a full range, please. Um, so um, you did um, Flash Gordon, which is also one of my. Yes favorite films which i've also got the vinyl soundtrack for down there in that book can i ask you if there is a picture of the exterior yes. set of the rocket ship because i yes. love that whole yes. I, I love that whole battle when that happens and uh, again i used to recreate that um with my figures i think it's called the, the go, War no, of there's, there's Ajax. Loads. Oh, look, there There's we loads go. Of unpublished this, incidentally, Lance, is the rare Japanese version, which has only just come out. Wow. So the Japanese version, which is great because Jap Japanese culture and art influenced the film greatly. So there's Ajax from the outside. Um, but, uh, I spoke to Michael from the Directors Guild, and I said to him, here, what about all the deleted scenes? He said, no, John, there's no deleted scenes because everything that, um, everything that was filmed went in because Dino didn't cut anything out. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, you sure about that? Because I've spoken to people and they said to me there are. And he said, well, I'd be surprised if there was. So we, I found the photos of deleted scenes, including the spaceship graveyard for a whole sequence where loads of spaceships had crashed on Mongo before. And wow. amazing scenes with um, the uh, Princess Aura, Ming's daughter, where I'm just trying to find her now. Oh, and the alternative ending that was made for the film, that's all here as well. Um, and so, so was not is that, that is that the alternative ending where Ming survives that that kind of thing? Yeah, Ming always did survive, so um, he never dies in the film. What actually happens is uh, Ming is transported to somewhere else. And spoiler, if you're going to buy this book, the somewhere else he's transported to has loads of skulls of Clytuses, different Clytus clones that have lived and died. So that's, um, that's interesting. The exterior of Princess Aura's rocket, the giant set that was built for Princess Aura's rocket. Wow. That picture's never, loads of these pictures never been published before. I had a great shot of Queen, a uh, rock group Queen, um, yeah. who was second choice, by the way, not first choice. To the film. In um, interesting. Mike wanted um, Pink Floyd. Um, but I got a great unpublished shot of Queen in here <clears throat> in all their regalia from the 80s, um, posing for a flash photo shoot never been seen before <clears throat> this up until doctor who was my best selling book this one sold like absolute you know batshit crazy um, yeah and it's only gone to its first foreign language edition now but um i'm i'm pretty keen to get my hands on a copy of that this is the lego mongo palace game that i told you about 
that I That's saw true. in Salute. And if you turn around uh, the other side of that, um, the interior of it depicts all of the scenes from the film. Oh, wow. Um, which is really, really clever. Yeah, and it's this ginormous Lego construction. It's even got Flash Gordon written down the side of the base. You can't quite see it there because it's cropped out. But um, yeah, I, I was quite blown away when I, I saw it, and they've got a big war rocket Ajax on a kind of lever that goes round the side of the – can be moved round <laughs> 360 degrees. It's amazing what um, some people will, will, will make, uh, you know. And, um, in fact, I've actually got a picture of that. I've got a picture of that war rocket. I can show you quickly. Um, they're, they're, these are all you can fa- find. There's various images on Google, but there it is. That's the one that they oh, had in the game. That's yeah, funny. yeah, it's funny, that's isn't it? Um, so let's talk we about. To, we spoke uh, to Brian uh, Blessed, Sam Jones, all of them. But here, did you know there was an unmade version of Flash Gordon by Nicholas Rogue? So the BFI had in their archive loads of pictures. From the Nicholas Rogue unmade version. Do you know I'd it heard Nicholas rumors. Rogue? I'd heard rumors about that. I mean, I didn't, didn't know how much, how far it went, or um, yeah, into production. All in there. So right. Dino uh, Nicholas Rogue had a passing of ways, and effectively he left the project because the the version he wanted to make was quite sort of um, the best way to describe it, quite adult and not really suitable for a family family audience. So that, he was effectively sacked. Right, and Mike Hodges got the part. You know how Mike Hodges got the um, directing gig on um, Flash Gordon? No, he tell won't, me. He, would, he doesn't mind me saying this. When he was alive, he didn't mind me saying this because it's sort of in public record. He'd just been sacked from Damien Omen 2. Right. And so he was suddenly available and looking for work, and Dino thought he'd be the right person because he's British and available. Well, he did a good job because, I mean, I've, I've got a real soft British. spot for the film. I, I really do like it for all its campiness and i actually think one of the reasons that the film worked is because it's it the campness and the colors and you know it's got that very poppy feel i mean it's not when you think about it tonally as a movie it's not that different from dalek invasion of earth in terms of the style the music's very brash and loud you know um so yeah i i I think they are both both great movies um Let's. I'm conscious of time, so let let let. You've got two new releases coming out in the not too distant future. I think Conan is out. Uh, is it out or available for pre-order? And Wicker Man is certainly available for pre-order. Um, so these are the same kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, both again. available for pre-order. Yeah. Well, what's the release yeah. date for Conan? Because I imagine that's going to be a big seller. Yeah, so Conan is out on the 8th of August everywhere, in the, here in the UK and everywhere else in the world. You can order, pre-order it now. And in it, of course, it's the making of the film with Arnold Schwarzenegger, etc. But for the very first time, I had full access to Oliver Stone's Conan the Barbarian from the mid-70s, which was what this film was based on. And right. uh, Jim Danforth, who is a kind of an animator and artist, he allowed me to reproduce his art from the Oliver Stone version in this book. And I'm forbidden from by the rights holder from showing you much of the inside. There's some inside uh, pictures, um, Lance, on Amazon. And uh, those pictures are, are allowed to be shared. But Let um, me have a it's just quick like look. a fabulous book full of all, all colour bits and bobs. So uh, um, I, I'm, I think I can show you this. Inside the sleeve, they always go extra on my books. It's a leather... Ooh. leather silver effect all the way around. I mean, it's like, this is like super expensive. They're like the Star Race toys of, of publishers here with um, the extra lengths they go to with my books. Um, well, I was going to say, when you when you picked it up, it felt like it had the weight of a sword. Um, you know, uh, let's have a look at the, there's the, so there are a few images um, on Amazon, right, yes. as you say. So some nicer on set stuff there. Um Oh, right. Look at that. Very Never been seen before, all of that no. stuff with the snake. That's the, that's the big snake in the, um, I think, in the orgy party scene, if I remember that's correctly. Right. Yes. Yeah, very controversial. Very controversial. Uh, funnily that. enough, this film was uh, released in the UK as a double A. I remember. Yes. I think it was probably yeah. the last double A. And I was, I was nowhere near enough old enough to go and see it. I think I was, it came out in 1980, didn't it? 82. Was it 80 82, or 82? 82. So yeah, I was 82. like 13 
but I was five foot eleven tall when I was when I was ten, and I was like the tallest oh, wow. in my year. I just shot up, and um, my next door neighbour was even taller than me, and he was the tallest in his year. So we always got him to go down and buy the tickets. And we both would sort of put on deep voices and you know, you know, two for cinema, one, please. And the woman was always very unconvinced, but we always memorized our birth dates and took off the appropriate years in order for us to be over 16. So I remember we, we, we got in to see this and were very, very pleased with ourselves. I think we went to see Alligator around the same time um, with uh, Robert uh, Foster. Um, it is a great movie. I've, I, I've got a real soft spot for this film um uh, particularly as just when you thought it's it's ended there's like another section it's almost mm -hmm. got like three ending segments um a bit like terminator when you think about arnie's next movie yeah. um what kind of access did you have to the uh, with this one i mean did you did you speak to um anybody from the dino de Laurentiis family the daughter who is of course still alive um, yeah, well, Rafaela did. She was the producer on the picture, so um, I spoke to her extensively. And her husband, Buzz Feitchins, who she co-produced the film with, and he was John Milius's right-hand man uh, back in the day. And so they're, they're a married couple now. So they both helped me enormously with the book in terms of access to everyone else. Um, Rafaela wrote the forward for me, which is great. Which is great. Um, I had access to everyone who was alive, basically. John Milius via emails because he's not very well at the moment. Um, and, and Oliver Stone, Ed Pressman, you know, all those people. Sadly, um, Dino's uh, second wife, Martha, she's no longer around. She helped me on Flash Gordon. She sadly died there um, about a year and a half ago. So Martha Schumacher, which is uh, rather a shame. But um, Barry Nolan and, and all the FX people, anyone who worked on Flash in the technical crew, a lot of them came across then for, um, for Conan. And right. it's interesting because um, Dino was trying to create franchises. If you think of King Kong, um, yeah. try to franchise that didn't quite happen. For Flash Gordon, he, he tried to buy Pinewood Studios at the time, and he wanted to make three Flash Gordon films back to back. That's why he spent so much money on it. It wasn't because he thought, ah, it's only money, I'll throw it away. Flash mm. Gordon in 1980 cost three times the original Star Wars. Three times. Wow. And yeah, it has no motion control um, special effects with the spaceships. And I was always fascinated by that. Why do the, the effects look quite rudimentary compared to Star Wars? And why is the flying not quite as good as Superman the movie, which came out in 78 for the Hawkman? Mm. So these questions were kind of burning in my mind with everyone I spoke to. And I'd always finish off by saying, oh, by the way, I need to ask you these questions about the budget and motion control and uh, the flying effects in Superman the movie and so on. So. And so... Yeah. It, it became this overarching kind of question mark for me. Well, why? If you can afford it, why didn't you do it? And of course, the the blinding, the obvious reason came clanking down with almost everyone I spoke to. And it wasn't that they didn't have the money. They did. They didn't have the time. So with all of these things, you need time and money. And often with a filmmaker, you can have lots of time, or you can have yeah. lots of money, but you can rarely get them both to come together. And so had they had more time with Flash Gordon, um, then perhaps they could have done a more sophisticated job, but then maybe it wouldn't have been as beloved. But um, it's fascinating. And, and with Conan, there was time and there was money, but Dino didn't like the film. When he saw it with Ned Tannen, the head of Universal, um, who'd, who'd basically guaranteed and funded it, they both sat in the preview screening thinking, what have we done? Because it was effectively an, an R-rated film. It wasn't quite an X certificate. They had to submit it three times to the American censors. Each time it costs money when you submit a film to the censors. And little bits and scenes were cut and so on. And it was 140 minutes. I think the largest running time of it now is 126 minutes. So it got a, 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 a is it an NC-17 rating. It got a restricted rating. It got instead of an X. So... They were worried that not enough people would go to see it. That's why for the sequel in 1984, they made it much more family-friendly in a PG. But I have the... I was looking through my research notes for it. Conan the Barbarian finished at number 11 in the worldwide box office that year. And right. the only other two kind of genre films in front of it would have been E.T. at number one and Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan at number nine. 
Right. Films that came after Conan the Barbarian in terms of box office success. At 18, The Dark Crystal. At 19, Blade Runner. At 20, The Sword and the Sorcerer. Oh, I love that film. Absolutely that love that movie. Such a naughty film because apparently that Sword and the Sorcerer only got green lit because everyone found out what Dino was doing with Conan. So they quickly rushed out a film. That's the story. But I yeah. agree with you, Lance. It's a top, top film. It's been restored in 4K now. It's worth hunting uh, down. Albert Poon, who directed that, um, is well, was a friend of mine because he just passed away. Um, oh, how wonderful. He had, you knew him. He had, yeah. he had brain cancer, but he actually gave me really lovely feedback and quotes for me to put on the cover of my last movie and oh, uh, stuff like that. So yeah, he was a really lovely guy and, and I, I got to interview him sort of one-to-one -one quite extensively about his career and budget cuts that he would get at like, you know, day one of filming, you suddenly find you're making not a five million uh, pound film, but a two and a half million pound film on, on, on day one of shooting. Imagine if you get that news and you're not shooting for 28 days, you know, you're shooting for 21 or something. Uh, he no, works under in, insane levels of pressure. Um, so I'm amazed he got any films finished at all. But yeah. So although his, his film finished number 20, it still made money. But the, the yeah. film 27 that, was, that lost money and actually shifted the share price of the Walt Disney Company was Tron. So it's a big, big flop for everyone involved. I love Tron. I love yeah, Tron. I did too. Um, I, I, I did too. There was quite a buzz in the UK about Tron when it when it came out, if I remember rightly. And there's different folks trying to get me to do the book on Tron, and that might happen soon. Um, at number fifty-one, it's a good job we sat down for this one. At number fifty-one, John Carpenter's The Thing, which was a box office disaster, absolute yeah, disaster the, for everyone. The critics and then at number sixty, Beast savaged Mark. it. Sorry, but that mm. was Beastmaster, the last one you mentioned. Be Beastmaster, Beastmaster, number 60. But the interesting yeah. thing was there was only about 10 sci-fi or fantasy films in 1982 compared to 1984 when the landscape changed. I haven't done a book about Conan the Destroyer, but it is the sequel. It's mentioned briefly at the end of mine. Um, yeah. It finished in the 34th position, and ahead of it was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom at number one, Ghostbusters at number three for Worldwide Box Office, Gremlins at five, Romancing the Stone at six, Star Trek three, The Search for Spock at eight, The Terminator at 11, Splash at number 13, Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes, very underrated at number 17, at 18, 2010. That's a I good like movie. It's a great movie. It's so underrated. Very underrated at film. Really loved it. Very underrated. At number 29, John Carpenter's Starman. Um, Another underrated 30, film. Very highly underrated. He's brilliant in that, Jeff Bridges. At number 32, ahead of Conan the Destroyer, June. So Dino's other big film release of, of 1984, June, which, which didn't lose money per se, but wasn't a big box office success. That's number 32. Conan the Destroyer all the way down at number 34. Um, so the I, own, there's I, only I, four I, films that did worse. I didn't like Conan the Destroyer for the very reason that I, I thought that they had set a bar with Conan. This is adult fantasy. You're going to see people's heads get let, lopped off. You're going to see blood. There might be some sex. Now, I, I would have been quite happy if there was no nudity in, in Conan the Destroyer because like, that's not why I went to see the films. But I wanted to see the brutality of the world, the, the, the violence. Um, and suddenly we had this family friendly there was a little bit of blood when people got struck in chests and things but it was very very minimal and then you know the big mutant monster at the end looked, looked, looked like a walrus had bred with a dog or something and not carlo rambaldi's best work who also i know did the worms for for, for june um yeah mm. I, I and i watched it yeah yeah i've watched it again recently um the destroyer and whilst there are some things in it I like, on the whole, I still think it's not a good good movie, sadly. Would um, you like to know the four films that did worse than Conan the Destroyer in 1984? Hit me. They are at number, at number, so Conan's at 34. At number 46, The Last Starfighter. Oh, that's so, that's, that's so annoying. That's annoying because um, I think it was partly due to the way the film was distributed it, 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 you know, that's a film that's really unfairly. Uh, yeah. Next one, I think, is awesome. The next so one is loved. a big hit with me. 
and uh, I think it's been unfairly treated, but you might not agree. At number 65, Supergirl. Not a fan. Watched it again recently, actually, and I'm still not a fan. So great music to... from Jerry Goldsmith. The, the, the score flying. is good. The flying. score is good. The score is excellent. Really good. Yeah. At number 67, Ice Pirates. Love Ice then... Pirates. <laughs> I'm not a fan of that. Um, but the last one, I hopefully we're a fan of this one. At number 69, um, with uh, with Dennis Quaid, Dreamscape. That's a good movie. That's an underrated film, actually. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like that movie. Wasn't but, Brainstorm you know, it, out it, around... Pressman was, was still a... Did, did, uh, sorry. No, Brainstorm was um, 1983. 1983. I knew that they came out on video not that far apart, those two movies. I remember yeah. seeing them both at the, the video store. Um, what Ed Pressman said was that the reason they, they toned it down for the sequel was that they wanted Conan, an old hero, to go into batting with Indiana Jones, the new hero of cinema. And they thought that they could, by creating a more family-friendly experience in the way that Raiders of the Lost Ark was, if they did something that's more of a quest where he picks up people along the way, so a little bit Ray Harryhausen, a little bit Indiana Jones, and less kind of brutal like the first film was, they could be up there in number one territory with Indiana Jones. So that was the talk in the industry at the time as well. Can Conan take on new kid on the block, Indiana Jones, who was new at the time? And it's madness to think that now, as we sit here all these years later, that um, that Conan the Destroyer had the cheek, the tenacity to think he could take on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I, I think <laughs> if they'd made it a second adult Conan, I don't think it would have bested Jones at the box office, but I don't think it would have ended up where it came. That I mean, difficult. We'll never know. It was a very busy year. You've got to admit, 1984 was, 1984 was packed with sci-fi and, and and fantasy and all sorts. So I think it was just, a, unfortunately, a busy busy year, 84. It was a few years I, in the 80s were, but I think it was... I, I have a I have a question for you, uh, John. Before we before we wrap up, oh, someone said sword and, sword and the sorcerer on four K. Yeah, we've got a little bit of lag occasionally, so that's why we're skipping each other occasionally. I do apologise if it sounds like I'm interrupting because that's not my intention. Um, uh, but I've got a question for you about June, which you might know the answer to because, like like me, you're a big um, David Lynch June fan. Um, Let's oh you you frozen now so I hope we haven't lost you let's let's hope we haven't lost John and I'll, if if we haven't I'll put my June question to him uh, but we will wrap up shortly because I did promise John we wouldn't go too long um, oh I've got you back you froze there for a, for a thirty seconds or so I think I think we're the weather's changed outside my my house <laughs> since we started talking I'm wondering if that's got a looks like it's about to pour down with rain here. Um, well, look, before we wrap up, let's see, if you, let's see if you can answer this question before we get cut off. I went to see June and Terminator on the same day because they were both released in the same week. And uh, me and my friend, we went to see Terminator at one cinema and I knew I wanted to see June on the biggest screen possible. So we travelled from Kingston to Richmond Odeon and we saw June on screen one. And um, I'll send you the link for this so you can read it in detail. But for some reason, Richmond Odeon was sent a um, cut of the film that um, no one else had. And it had all of the scenes in it with Janice and Molly Rin, which would turn up on the laser disc many years later. I mentioned the humanoid uh, there. Look, I mentioned Last Starfighter as well. Um, and um, it was... It was it was a cut of the film, and it was a perfect cut. It wasn't like the footage was weird or anything. Uh, there's Molly Rin. So Molly Rin's scenes, and she's now a friend of mine, and she's on my Facebook. Um, there was about 20 minutes of extra footage, um, most of it with her scenes. Some of the battles were a bit longer um, as well. And then the reason that I know it was a different version was because I went to see it again on Saturday night with my dad in Kingston. And I'm watching the movie and I'm thinking, what, 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 what's happened? This is way shorter. There's loads of bits missing. And to this day, I have not been able to answer the question why 
um, Kingston Odeon on the week of the UK release got an edit of the movie that no one else had. Um, and uh, this, um, uh, even Molly reached out to Raffaella for me, but she never got an answer to this question. Um, I wonder if you might I can know. probably tell you. Um, yeah, there's two versions of the film. So Dino used to make a and he would charge, and networks would, would pay you per minute. So if you get the 4K version of King Kong 76, there's the TV cut with it, which is like three hours long. It has loads of scenes, no, not lots more of Kong, just lots of people chatting on boats and on corridors and on telephones. So it kind of expands it out. There's a television cut for June, which David Lynch took his name off. I think it says directed by Brian Smithies, which is... The yeah, I've, name, I've got that so. version as well. Yeah. So it's probably that version that you may have seen or an intermediary version of that because that's quite long. It's the television version and prints were struck of it um, because when it was sent to different television networks, TV networks often used to tele me their own pan and scanning uh, per their own requirements. So they get a show print, they get like an answer print or a married print. Um, so it's likely that there was a kind of mistake with the distributors and the exhibitors kind of getting the, uh, the television print in the theatre instead. But the television print starts with kind of lots of artwork. It yeah, it wasn't, that, it wasn't that version, but it had a lot of the scenes that were in that version. Um, so it was much closer to, the, to yeah. the cinema release. So somewhere along the lines, there must have been a, a sort of, OK, we're going to print the middle version. And somehow that that version must have ended up in a batch of cinema reels, and and I guess like you said, it got mixed up. And it's amazing, though, isn't it, that I just happened to catch it. Um, that's so lucky, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And it was, of course, it was shot on seventy millimeter, and so yeah. if you were lucky enough to see it in seventy mil as well, that was quite something. Whereas that's why I travelled. Yeah, yeah, that, that's why I travelled to that cinema to see it. It was the only that one that was showing it in, in seventy in, mil. In seventy millimeter, you know. Yeah. Whereas Terminator was shot on thirty five millimeter. Still looks great, um, but uh, and you can blow up, of course, to seventy mil. It's never the same. Um, mm. But to shoot on seventy mil and to, and to exhibit on seventy mil is quite something. And uh, you were lucky to have seen that, really. But I, I, I wonder if the TV cut version you saw would have been a seventy mil print, because um, I think they only struck thirty five mil prints. So the mystery for tv so the mystery kind of continues i wonder yeah i mean the 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 one that's got the big sort of backstory with the animator uh, the, the paintings and talks about the rise of the robots and all that stuff mm. that was a version that was subsequently released on laserdisc sometime later that's right, and yeah. um I, and i saw that somebody had a bootleg video of that going mm. around in the 90s or something and I, that's when i saw that version and that was when i was like oh i didn't imagine those things because no one would believe me I was telling yeah. people, I've seen a version of this that's longer, and everyone was going, but sure, sure, sure. And I, I said, oh, you know, and I kept telling people, no, th th these scenes were definitely in it. And there, there were some scenes in it that I've never seen in any version. Um, oh, right. You know, so uh, I, I don't know what version this was. It must have just been some kind of Dulux print that was made that, that they were showing that did the rounds and somehow got put in the wrong box, I guess. Um, but it was a perfect. Possibly. I mean, film distribution. Well, that was quite magical. Yeah, and I, I spoke to Raffaello about June extensively because I'm quite keen to do an official book on June. Lots of people try and do uh, unofficial fan books and so on, but um, the studio haven't licensed a, a book yet. And uh, I'm quite keen that with Raffaello with me, we might convince uh, Mr. Lynch to talk because uh, he doesn't talk publicly about. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah. Well. I'm back again. Uh, yeah, sorry that we we got a bit of lag, but I caught that you said that David Lynch doesn't talk publicly about June. Um, was the last thing I heard. Uh, did you have anything to add on, on that? Only that you know, we we'll, between myself and Raphael, we'll we'll try and get him to talk if I get the book on that. But um, I have three more books waiting for me now, and uh, so it's it's kind of. Um, it's it's a bit of a head scratcher because you can't say no to things when you're offered them, um, but uh, sure. it's always exciting to be offered new things. So. Well, mate, if if you do do the book on that, you you you've got to you've got to mention that story about how I I saw that um, uncut version of it or weirdly cut. It was actually it was a perfect cut. It all made sense. It, it just was a version with scenes in that that no one else got to see for ages. Um, I've put the link for that for people in the chat in case they're. 
they're curious. So, John, to wrap up, what, what are the official release dates of Conan? And then you've got the Wicker Man book coming as well. So official release for Conan is the 8th of um, August. And I think it's the 29th of October for the Wicker Man. Having to look at the press release to confirm that, but um, I think it's twenty nine, either twenty ninth or twenty fourth of October for the Wicker Man, and uh, it's it's great. The Wicker Man has lots of it's a similar sort of thing. It's a large format coffee table art book, and it has um, all the things in there that you'd want to know about the film. We straighten out the story, the Christopher Lee story about what really happened. Twenty fourth of October, there we are, and one hundred ninety two pages. So it's quite a quite a whopper. We found lots of stuff, lots of great stuff in there. Well, you know what, um, possibly because I think there's, you know, there's a lot more that we, we could talk about. So maybe what you could do is you could come back and give us another interview um, in October because we haven't really talked about The Wicker Man. And I dare say by then you'll probably also have another book or two um, available for pre-order that we can we can get into. And uh, um, I'll try and get because uh, one of my regular co-hosts, Matthew Holmes, um, who, who does a lot of these interviews with me, but he's currently... Um, in the Scottish Highlands on holiday at the moment. He's normally in Australia. He, he's a massive yeah. Ray Harryhausen fan. He's really gutted he couldn't be here uh, today, particularly as you were showing off monsters and things like that. Exactly. And uh, uh, we are going to do, as I mentioned to you before, we're going to do a top three Ray Harryhausen monster stream or top. what, what are our favourite top five Ray Harryhausen monsters. So uh, we, we might have John yeah. as a guest on that stream as well, because I think you'd be a great guest to... Uh, to have on that um uh hodgman is saying yes wicker man uh more keen to see that so um and um uh thrash pondo ponds uh so people are, are very um uh very glad that you came on um lots of comments about things like dreamscape and discussion of whether it was the first pg-13 movie i certainly remember around that time it may it may well have been but somebody said it was red dawn Red Dawn was a 15 in the UK, by the way. Yeah, so, Red Dawn was the first. John Milius didn't do Conan the Destroyer because he was working on Red Dawn. And it was in America. It was the first PG-13 in America was Red Dawn. That's yeah. correct. Well done. Well done. You you yeah. win my gratitude and a thumbs up. Yeah, possibly a Dalek sticker if you, uh, you know, give a nice review somewhere. Listen, absolutely, John, absolutely. Thank, thanks so much for giving uh, up your time and bearing with us with the uh, technical eye on a sphere. Uh, interference we did have a few freezes and lags occasionally but i think i think for the most part i could see and hear you on all the important questions so that's really great uh so people can find you on twitter of course uh i've got the link for your website already down there there's also a link there uh for the dalek book and that will take you to all the other books i've also just put the link for the conan one in the chat guys um so yeah and david macy just said if you haven't hit the like button uh, please do. Um, someone's talking about an extended tele TV version of Midway. That's right. That was shown in two parts. Probably not John's uh, arena, the World War II stuff. Um, but that might be a book I might be interested in doing because I'm a big history guy. Uh, so, guys, thanks so much, John, for uh, coming on. I'm going to be back next. I think the next time I'm back on is next Tuesday. But I might do another Lone Wolf book on Monday on the uh on the on the playlist for the lone wolf books uh if you saw that last night you'll you'll know exactly what i'm talking about uh hodgman's just said thank you what a great chat yeah it is and listen i know people don't normally see my channel um during the day because i'm not normally streaming during the day I'm, I'm doing other things like acting coaching and writing and that sort of thing but we've got six people watching now even so uh we've just hit two thousand subscribers uh Please keep spreading the word. There's going to be a lot more interviews uh, like this, guests like John, who've got great experience and um, knowledge of stuff in the industry to share. I've got stuntwoman Debbie Evans coming on. And, John, you'll like this. One of her first credits was the Linda Evans version of Wonder Woman from the 1970s TV. Oh, wow. And she started there, and she's done every Fast and Furious film except for one, and she is still going. So she's got 400... Wow stunt woman credits 400 on imdb and it took me two hours to prep the interview with her to discuss what of those 400 credits we're going to talk about um i don't think one interview with her is going to be enough either um so guys thanks so much for tuning in that's it from myself and john for today don't forget to like and subscribe do check out 
John's books on Amazon. You can pre-order Conan and Wicker Man now. Flash Gordon and so on are available while stocks last. So if you want to get your hands on a copy, I suggest you get them really soon. And on that note, I will see you really, uh, everybody again very soon. If not next Tuesday, possibly Sunday in the interim, just keep a lookout for stuff and uh, we'll be back. Take care.